transmission of coronavirus doesn't just mean somebody spluttering next to you on the bus. It's about how tiny droplets of virus can stay in the air for quite a while. And that's a prospect which raises obvious worries about daily life. The World Health Organization this week says it's got concerns. Professor Wendy Barclay is chair of the Influenza Virology Department at Imperial College London, and she's a world expert on the airborne transmission of respiratory viruses and a member of the government SAGE committee. When I spoke to her just a little earlier, I began by asking why airborne transmission was such a worry. Yeah, so what we know is that viruses can be expelled into the air from infected people in very small droplets. Uh, and sometimes even in droplets that are so small, we call them aerosols. And these aerosols can remain suspended in the air and can travel some distance away from the, the person who's, who's breathed them out. Uh, and we do know that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, uh, can remain viable, remain infectious in these very small droplets. So that raises the possibility and indeed the likelihood that, that, that COVID can be transmitted through these small particles that can travel through the air. Do we have any idea about how long these particles remain dangerous? Yeah, so, so laboratory studies where the virus has been sort of purposefully put into the air uh, tell us that the, the virus can remain there for more than an hour in its infectious form. Now, this week, the World Health Organization said that airborne transmission can't be ruled out in some cases. Was that an important change of emphasis from them? Yes, it is the first time that the World Health Organization have sort of um, acknowledged that the airborne route contributes to the spread of this disease. Of course, there are other routes as well that we have to keep bearing in mind, the, the close contact routes directly touching someone or touching a contaminated surface. So, you know, washing our hands is still very important. But what this new acknowledgement means is that, that the route through the air probably also contributes in some circumstances. So good ventilation, absolutely essential. Now, we do know that there was a restaurant in Guangzhou in China where there was transmission through the air system. So what about air conditioning in all of this? Some air conditioners simply push the air around inside a room. And so that's not really ventilation. That doesn't dilute the virus out anymore. Um, and indeed, the restaurant situation was very interesting because the, the people who acquired their infection were sort of downstream of the airflow that the air conditioner was, was producing. So in those conditions, air conditioners aren't really helpful. They're just sort of channeling the virus in one particular direction. But there are other ways of handling the air uh, it, where the air gets sort of replenished and, and exchanged. So this was also a week which, with the beginning of the unlocking, lots of people are thinking about going back to, I don't know, choir practices or gyms or exercise classes. Are there some things, thinking about the airborne transmission of COVID, that we should be avoiding? There have been a number of outbreaks associated with choirs, for example, and it's quite possible that we generate more of these small droplets when we, we talk loudly or sing, or perhaps when we're exercising. So in those circumstances, you definitely would want to be in a well-ventilated room. And, and perhaps also uh, uh, the social distancing that we've all become used to is useful. So there's been a lot of discussion this week about masks and face coverings. Now, as a scientist who specializes in airborne transmission of virus, what's your view? Are they actually useful? The use of face masks is really about protecting other people from you in case you're infected. We do think that this virus is breathed out in droplets. Whether or not those droplets are large or small, it's quite likely that a face mask will remove some of them from your breath. And so if you, you know, are infected by the virus, but perhaps not yet ill, um, but you are at a point where you've got virus in your breath, then you may be hazardous to other people. You spoke a moment ago about people who don't feel ill, nevertheless passing on the disease, what's called asymptomatic transmission. Uh, as a scientist, when did you first know that asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19 could be a problem? We've all been conscious that respiratory viruses can transmit from asymptomatic people, but it's very difficult to know at the outset of an outbreak uh, what proportion of events like that will happen for any particular virus, it can be quite different. And of course, back in January and February, this was a coronavirus, a little studied 
group of viruses. And the, the best information that we really had to go on was the previous coronavirus known as SARS-CoV or SARS-CoV-1. And there, the proportion of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission was very, very low, if, 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 if not wow. negligible. Right. So most of the early thinking was around what experience we had with other uh, coronaviruses, particularly SARS-CoV. Of course, as we've moved through the, the outbreak and the pandemic, new data has come to light, and it now is obvious to, to many of us that you, you can get some pre-symptomatic and probably asymptomatic transmission going on. Professor, thanks very much for talking to us this morning.